Well, welcome to David's Community Bible Church this morning. Would you stand as we prepare our hearts to worship today? And we're going to be opening with a song that we did in our, um, in our uh, VBS program. And it was very uh, well received. So sing with us as we sing Walking Free. The verdict was guilty. Case closed. The end. No chance for me to ever leave this prison of my sin. I know it might sound crazy, but one day a key unlocked that cell. I heard a small voice say, your debt's been paid by somebody else. And now I'm walking, walking, walking free. No more darkness, guilt has lost its grip on me. When mercy called my name, those chains fell at my feet. And now I'm walking, walking, walking free. Now I ain't nothing perfect. I still stumble every single day. I still get knocked down, but the difference now is that's not where I stay. Cause I got a savior. Who knows everywhere I've been And he's telling me that I never have to go back there again And now I'm walking, walking, walking free No more darkness, guilt has lost its grip on me When mercy called my name, those chains fell at my feet And now I'm walking, walking Today, we're going to sing another song called Graves into Gardens about the transformation power of our Savior.
This morning, I just want to say a, a big welcome to our guests this morning. I know we have several guests with us. If you would um, go ahead and fill out that connection card, there should be a connection card in the seat back in front of you somewhere, and fill that out and bring it to me through the double doors after the service today, and you can exchange that for a Dunkin' Donut gift card. And uh, usually Pastor Danny holds one of those up, but he is out hunting in Colorado right now. The big elk and mule deer and th such things like that. But I, I saw at least the forecast before he left. It was supposed to be minus one while he's up there. So, I mean, I'm just picturing Pastor Danny. He's from Florida, y'all. That boy's blood, has he's never seen anything below like 20 degrees, I don't think. So, uh, so for him, minus one is going to be a big wake-up call. 
I hope, uh, I hope his beard, you know, keeps his face from getting frostbit, something like that. So anyway, want to say a big welcome to our guests. Also on our next slide here, we have a recreation concert and uh, it's going to be Sunday, November the 13th at 6 p.m. So please come out. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great time watching them sing. They have tremendous harmonies and such. Uh, also, we have a hymn sing next Sunday morning at 1015. If, uh, if you love the hymns of the faith, please come out at 1015 and we're going to sing some great hymns of the faith together. Also, um, an announcement that isn't in my slides, but wanted to make mention of is if you're interested in helping out decorating the church for Christmas, please uh, come forward and meet with Cheryl Weaver after the service. I believe it's going to be right up here up front. And uh, then she's going to get kind of a team and a plan together for decorating the church. So if you have interest in that, please come on out uh, up front after the service for that. Also, we have our Thanksgiving Day meal at David's, and we have food donations that have been requested from you, from the congregation. You can sign up in the lobby today for all of the donations. Um, and then also, we need volunteers on Wednesday to prepare the meals, and then also on Thursday to help serve the meals. And I believe uh, people can also, are going to be running out to shut-ins and things like that, help deliver and things like that. So. We have a Thanksgiving Day meal. Next is our church photo directory. We are at 60%. So we went up 6% from last week or so. Um, but I, I, we got to get to 70% this week, guys. So I think if we make a big push, go down after the service. It's not painful. Uh, it, Brian just snaps your picture. It's going to be really simple. And what we're going to do, though, is if you just keep refusing to do it, we're going to start scrolling your names up on the thing and just kind of, you know, just going to call you out. So get it done before Danny and I have to call you out for uh, not having your picture taken. It's simple. It's easy. Brian's right down there in the Sunday school room off the large fellowship hall. Go down and get your picture taken today. Next, we have... A big thank you to our Fall Festival volunteers. Come on. We had some awesome, get this. Uh, we had, I, I heard from Jill last night, 514 registered guests at the Fall Festival last night. It was our best attended Fall Festival. Now here's the thing, that doesn't include any of the volunteers. That's just the registered guests with volunteers that were probably over 600, I would guess. So that is, that is just a tremendous, best turnout, I believe, since I've been at David's. And uh, just a, wasn't it an awesome night out? Man, like 60 degrees and sun shining, what a, what a great night. So thank you so much for all your efforts that you poured into the fall festival. Next, we have our ushers headed forward right now at this time. And tonight, we do not have youth pray for Danny. He's having a whole different experience up in Colorado right now. So uh, just pray for him. I just hope he comes back alive at this point. We'll take that as a win. He's at 10,000 feet. He's never been above 100 feet before, or 200. What are we at here? Like 200 and some feet, 300 feet? I don't know. He's never been above where, wherever we're at here. Peter's Mountain is his high water mark as far as uh, elevation. So he's cruising around at 10,000 feet right now, seeing white spots, I imagine. Um, not snowflakes, even though they're up there too. But uh, yeah, pray for his oxygen deprivation to subside. Let me pray for our offering. Lord God, thank you so much for this church, for the fall festival, for the great turnout, for the great weather. Just pray a blessing on this service. Pray a blessing on the rest of our worship. Please bless our offering. Thank you for such a generous body of believers. Thank you for the finances that you have provided, God. And I pray that every dime, every penny would be used for your glory, for your honor. Let it be all as unto you. Pray that you'd bless both the gift and the giver today. Be with us in the rest of our service. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can stand after the plates have passed you and join us. is my firm foundation the rock on which 
which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would joy. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength, because I built my life on Jesus. He's never left Shine. 
the most powerful, the most wonderful name that's ever been uttered in all of history. Yours is the name above all names. So Jesus, I pray that your name would be glorified in this place. We know that you can transform lives. We know that you can change hearts as only you can. God, we just give ourselves to you in every possible way. I pray that you would work in our hearts today, mold and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Pray that we would not leave here the same way we came in, that we would be changed. God, use us as instruments in your hands for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious and wonderful and mighty name. And all God's children said, amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing And you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me And let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah 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 Amen Amen Hallelujah 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 Let my Jesus change your life made a difference in your heart and uh, aren't you thankful for our youth team how awesome right I'm a little biased but uh, this is my favorite youth team around I think they're pretty awesome so anyway our children ages second well, I'm sorry ages four through second grade can be dismissed for junior church at this time 
All right, you can open your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. It's great to have such a talented youth group. I mean, I think as I counted, I'm not entirely sure, there was two seniors up there, yeah. maybe. So those are faces that you'll be seeing again, and those are some, not, that's not the whole youth team. There's a lot more kids involved with that, and they lead worship every Sunday night at the uh, Rock during youth groups. So we are so blessed to have such a talented group of young people to lead us into worship. So Romans chapter 8, we began this chapter a couple weeks ago. It is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible, in the most important book in the Bible, the book of Romans. And we come to this beautiful treasure of truth that is Romans chapter 8. So we are taking our time as we go through it and picking out to the best of our ability the, the jewels, the diamonds of God's truth as we go along. Last week, we focused in verses uh, 5 to 8, that section right there, and we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit, that now that we are saved, we walk in the Spirit. Our great teacher, uh, Gene Heaster, who passed away, is with the Lord right now. He would often talk about walking in the Spirit, wits, he called it. That was sort of one of his famous teachings, to walk in the Spirit. He will remind us week after week as he taught us uh, to walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. We began to unpack this idea of what it means to live or to walk in the Spirit. It means we have a new direction. We're headed in a new, new direction. We have a new walk. We have a new mind. We think differently. We have new affections. We have new loves that motivate us and new desires that push us forward in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, verse 8, we have a new goal in life. That's where we ended. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but those who walk according to the Spirit live a life pleasing to God. So we sort of unpack this, this work of sanctification, of growth that the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in us in chapter 8 and laid this out with the, the idea of newness, the, the walking in newness of life, walking according to the Spirit. So I want to continue that theme today as we continue to talk about this, this new relationship. We have a new resident that lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit. And because he comes to, to believers, to Christians, we have a new obligation that we must fulfill. So that's where we're going to go today. We're going to, we're going to base our time together in Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 9 through, um, now let's go to 13, 9 through 13. So this is God's will, God's word, God's purpose for us today in these verses. So Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. For in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, your physical bodies, through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit, but if the, by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. This is God's word for us today. May he add his blessing to his word as we study it today. Let's go before him now and ask him to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we come before your word that you would illuminate, that your Holy Spirit would come and illuminate our hearts and minds that we might understand your word today. Lord, that you might remove all distractions, you might remove all anything that may crowd itself into our minds and hearts that may hinder our understanding of this important text, Lord. That you may challenge us and encourage us to walk according to the Spirit, Lord. That you might encourage us to kill sin in our flesh, in our lives, Lord. To grow in our knowledge and love for Jesus Christ, Lord. May today's time in our text uplift us and encourage us, Lord. May we walk forth from here in just a short amount of time rejoicing, knowing that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that, 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 the, the Holy Spirit lives in us and is empowering us and enabling us to overcome our sin. May that be an encouraging word for us today, Lord. Help us in this task before us. Bless us, Lord. 
Bless this time we have together. Bless those that are home watching online because of sickness and, and inability to be here. Bless them. Unite them with us as we study God's Word. Bless those that we love that, that are not here today because of sickness and ill health and, and, and surgeries and procedures. Lord, bless them. Care for them. Heal them. Strengthen them. Bring them back to us, back to our fellowship shortly, Lord. Be with our nation. Be with our leaders. Heavenly Father, be uh, with those that serve us in uniform all around the world. Protect them, watch over them. Lord, be with this, this election time as we enter into this, this November, our election month. Lord, we pray, Lord, we pray that righteousness would prevail, Lord, that righteousness in this land would prevail, that morality would prevail, that common sense would prevail. Lord, we just pray we know that all leaders over us are appointed by you. And we pray that you would have mercy on this nation, that you would bless this nation once again, that you would bless this state of Pennsylvania and the right men and women uh, would be elected that can lead us on, on a good path, on a righteous path, Heavenly Father. So we pray for that, Lord. And we pray for us as we come before your word, Lord. We pray that it would not return void, that it would accomplish its purpose today in our hearts and our minds, the purpose of transformation. And that would happen today, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, chapter 8, as we come before chapter 8 again, this is a chapter on sanctification. We've talked about that word. We are justified before Christ. We are clothed in Christ. Righteousness declared righteous in Him. Justified. We are alive in Christ, right? But in chapter 8, we come to the process of growth. What is a justified, redeemed Christian who is alive in Christ, who's forgiven of all their sins, what does that look like while on earth in our daily life, our daily struggles? So I put a chart up there to, to, to bring forth some of these contrasts before these two because, again, it is deadly poison to mix together justification and sanctification. It will wreck your theology. It will wreck your understanding of salvation. It will wreck your understanding of the Scripture. So we have to make sure we are careful to delineate and define what justification is and what sanctification is. That's why we go back to this week after week. And you have the, the chart there and some of the differences we see between the two. We are declared righteous, but in sanctification, while we are alive on earth, we are being made righteous. We are instantaneously and completely justified through the righteousness of Christ his imputed righteousness given to us. We're clothed in His righteousness, alive in Christ. But in the flesh, in this life, our flesh is dead and dying. It is unredeemed. We have been forgiven of sin. We're no longer on the penalty of sin. We're no longer on the power of sin. But sin is still in our realm. Until we get to heaven, we still live in a fallen world. And our flesh is still fallen. We still struggle with sin. That's Romans chapter 7. You can never forget Romans chapter 7. You don't understand chapter 8 without chapter 7. We don't want to live in chapter 7 in the struggle with our sin and our flesh. We want to move on to our sanctification in chapter 8, but we can't get to 8 without 7. That's the struggle. This is an, an indicative truth. An indicative in the, in the Greek language of Romans is a truth. You are justified. There's no doubt in that. You are completely justified. That's an indicative. That's a truth. Now, sanctification is an imperative, a command. Now, be sanctified. Now, act, your, act out your righteousness. You've been clothed in righteousness of Christ. Now, act that out in your life. Be who you are in Christ, positionally. Now, practically, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, make your justification real. Make it a reality in your life. That's the process of sanctification. As we come to chapter 8, we are looking at how the Holy Spirit is the agent of sanctification, that He lives in us, He dwells in us, He empowers us, and enables us to live as Christians. That's His purpose of why He dwells in us. So today, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit, and then we are going to look at His power in us to kill sin and to grow in Christ Jesus in us. Okay, so the first thing we want to establish is the Holy Spirit's person and work in our life. We have a new resident that has taken up residency in our heart, in our lives, in our soul. The Holy Spirit, God himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit lives, dwells in you. That's a truth you all know. You knew that's in Sunday school. You knew that a long time ago. It's one of the first things you learn about being a Christian. And when you commit your life to Jesus Christ... You repent and believe in Him as your Lord and Savior. 
the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. We know this. This is, this is Christianity 101. This is, this is a truth that we all know, but we often pass over it, and we forget how awesome and amazing this truth is that God, the God of the universe, and the person and work of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's taking up residency in your heart, in your life. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. He lives in you. He empowers you spiritually. We just skip over that thought. We don't think about that. We don't think of the awesomeness of that. That God himself lives in you. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of our Trinitarian God, our three-in-one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God. All God, three persons of the Godhead. Our God exists in, in three personalities, right? But it is one, we serve one God who exists in three persons. And I love verse 9. Look back at verse 9 where we began. Look at verse 9. Let's read through it again one more time and look at how the Spirit is referred to. Right here. You, are however, not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. The Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God, so now the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God, dwells in you, and anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, that's another way he's referred to, does not belong to him. So in this one verse, we have the Holy Spirit referred to in three different titles. The Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ. This is the, the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is described in these three ways, pointing us to our Trinitarian God. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life. We see these different titles for the Holy Spirit all pointing to his mission to work in us. But here in verse 1, you are seeing a very Trinitarian verse that is pointing us to that our God exists three in one. So to say the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, to say the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life, to say the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, to say the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, you're saying the same thing. It's the same person. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. So we could say, let's extrapolate, we could even say this. Christ lives in you. God lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Are all those three statements the same? Yes. They're the same. They're all true. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you. Therefore, God has taken up residence in you. The Spirit of Christ lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. This is the God we serve, the three-in-one God. And the Holy Spirit is, is God. And here's the amazing truth, that He has taken up residency in us. He dwells in us. Verse 9, the Spirit dwells in you dwells, lives, resides inside of you. Five times in verses 9 through 11, in just these three verses, nine times we have our union with Christ mentioned. Nine, uh, excuse me, five times in these verses we see in you or dwells in you. In. That word in is an important word. We live in Christ. We're united with Christ, and Christ lives in us. This is our union with Christ. We are united with Christ. We are baptized into Christ, into his life. We are baptized into his death. We are baptized into his, his resurrection and his ascension. We saw that in chapter 6. We are united with Christ. We are one with Christ. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit, that he will live in us, that we are part of him, and he is part of us. This is the promise that Jesus laid out for us all the way back in John in the upper room as he is teaching about the Holy Spirit. One of the main things Jesus tells his disciples on this last night he is with them as he teaches about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit will live in you. God will live in you. John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, another paraclete. We talked about that last week. One who will come alongside you. Another, that word, there's many, there's a couple words in Greek for another. This is the specific word that means another of the same kind. You will get another God, another one like me. Not another God, but another one who's exactly like me, the Holy Spirit. Not a different other the same other, another that is like me, that is God, the helper, the paraclete, he will walk beside you, he will be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, that's another title the Holy Spirit has, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know the Holy Spirit. You know him because he dwells with you and he dwells in you. That's a promise. Acts 1.8 says it, right? You will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He will empower you to what? And Acts 1.8 gives us very specific, to be my witnesses, to be my martyrs, my martyruses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ends of the earth. This empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, he will be with you, he will live in you. The major proof, the, the most relevant major proof that you are a Christian is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. 
That's proof number one, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Every blessing you receive as a Christian, everything good you receive spiritually in your life comes directly through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Without the Holy Spirit in your life, there's nothing good in your life. Nothing good. Not, not even like 0.001% of goodness. There's nothing good. All the good in your life, all the blessings in your life has been brought to you through the person and work of the Holy Spirit indwelling you as a Christian. He's promised to us. He lives in us. He's God. He baptizes us. One of the first things the Holy Spirit does is He baptizes us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit in Scripture refers to salvation. When you hear, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're, you should think, I'm saved. I know Jesus. That's the act of salvation. It means that at the moment of salvation, when you confess Christ as your Lord, you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you completely and totally. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happens at the moment of salvation. That is salvation. There is no second baptism. There is no second work. Or you don't have to, after you're a Christian, get the Holy Spirit. He is in you at the moment of salvation. You are baptized into the Holy Spirit in the Spirit at salvation. You say, well, how do we know that? There's so many verses about this. We know this because we study the Bible in a systematic way. We have a thing called systematic theology, and we have books out in our bookstore, and Wayne Grudem writes this book that we use. It's called Systematic Theology. What it means by that is a system of theology means that they take a topic, in this case the Holy Spirit, and they go from Genesis to Revelation on this one topic. What does the whole Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Not just one verse. Not just one book, the entire Bible. And as we study, the entire Bible on the Holy Spirit becomes very clear, and truth on the Holy Spirit becomes very clear that He indwells us at the moment of salvation. See, you got to be careful when people teach you and they cherry-pick verses. They'll take a verse out of context, one verse, and they'll stick it over here, and then they'll teach truth based on that one verse. Say, wait a minute, that verse needs to exist in the system of theology that we know about that. Because if you don't have a system, if you don't see everything said about the Holy Spirit, you can easily, you will be led astray. That's called topical, cherry-picking verses. You can prove anything from the Bible by just taking verses out. That's not how we study God's Word. We study God's Word as a system. What does the whole Bible teach about the Holy Spirit and salvation? It teaches that at the moment of salvation, you are completely, totally immersed and indwelt with the Holy Spirit. He fills us. He uses us. Those things change over time. But you have the Holy Spirit when you are saved. He seals us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, this is the moment of salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. He is a seal. He is a guarantee. How many like that word guarantee? That's a great word. He is the guarantee. Now, if for some reason you think the Holy Spirit can leave your life or you can lose your salvation, is that a guarantee? That's a lousy guarantee. If you believe that, then you have to say to God, you know, you are a lousy guarantee or you don't guarantee anything. This isn't a guarantee. See, what good is a seal if the seal doesn't last? What good is a guarantee if you're not guaranteed? He comes and he baptizes us. He seals us to the day we see Jesus face to face in heaven. We are sealed. It is a guarantee. He is a deposit on our inheritance. What guarantee is it if it doesn't last? What kind of seal is that if the seal can be broken and made and null and void? That's not much of a seal. He seals us, and lastly, he's active in us. He comes, he lives in us, he's promised us, he baptizes us, he's active in our salvation, he seals our salvation, and he is active in our lives. We've seen up to now, uh, especially in chapter 3 and chapter 4, we see the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. He regenerates us. He saves us. He's, he's one of the, you know, all three of the Godhead work together in our salvation. The Holy Spirit's very active in saving us. But it's not like once we're saved, he's like, okay, you're on your own. Have fun. Good luck. He's active in our sanctification. He's active after we are saved. He's as active for salvation. He's after salvation. He fills us, He empowers us, He convicts us, He produces fruits in us, He gifts us spiritually, He teaches us, He prays for us, He leads us, on and on. We can make a list of a hundred things that the Holy Spirit is active in the believer's life right now. Right now, the, the Holy Spirit's active in your life. 
He's right now doing, he's working right now, currently, at this very moment. I know one ministry he's doing, and I pray for this almost every Sunday, that he would do the ministry of illumination in your hearts. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. That you could read God's Word and understand it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit can read God's Word, they can memorize it, they can know the history of it, they can pull it apart, they can understand the words and the grammar of it, but they don't understand the spiritual significance of it because they don't have the Holy Spirit. You know this. You've seen this in people's lives. You bring an unsaved a friend of yours, or brother of yours, or sister of yours that you love dearly, so you got to come here. you got to come to this revival service. you got to hear this preacher. you gotta, you got to interact with this. And they sit there, and you're overcome, and you're brought to tears through the beauty of the spiritual truth that's being taught. And you turn to your friend over there, and he's on his phone. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. What's the big deal? What's this big deal about? They, because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They, don't, they, they can't figure it out. They don't understand it like we understand it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's his act of work in us. Everything of significance spiritually, listen, I said this before, I'll say it again, comes to us through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. There's only one way to God. There's only one way that blessings come to us, and that is through the highway of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. We have a, he dwells in us. He lives in us thirdly. He owns us. He owns us. Look at verse 9. Keep reading verse 9. That's where we are. You're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. New, new sentence. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not one of Christ's followers. You're not a believer. You're not a Christian. The Holy Spirit's work is to make us, cause us, listen, to belong in Jesus' family, in God's family. He's the one who brings us into the family. He's the one who unites us with our Father. He's the one who makes us part of the family. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we belong to Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's a great privilege. We're going to talk a lot about this next week. Because when we get into verse, what verse is it? 15. Man, it's a great doctrine there. It's called the adopt. We are adopted as sons. We're going to get into that next week. I don't want to go too far ahead. But you can see in these verses, the immediate verses all around us, we belong to him. We are sons of God if the Holy Spirit leads us, verse 14. We are adopted, verse 15. We are heirs with Christ. What does that mean that we're heirs with Christ? It means God has a family and he looks at us as sons like he looks at Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ being our elder brother, the firstborn, the elder brother. You know, he's the, he's the head guy, but we're all brothers as well. In this family line, we are heirs with him. Look at these privileges. We're going to pull these apart next week. But, but the Holy Spirit causes us and is the agent whereby we are adopted. We are born into this family. We now belong to, to the Father. What manner of love is this that we would be called the children of God? What kind of love is this that the God of the universe would look at Alan Briggs and say, that's my son? What love is this? What, what is this? What power is this? Who, who in, 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 their, in their biggest dreams, could ever come up with the audacious truth that the God of the universe would call me his son? I mean, a human being, it's, it's beyond human comprehension. There's no human mind that could ever conceive such a great idea. It had to have come from God. Because who would have sat down and thought, the God of the universe wants to call me his son? He wants to, me to be in his family. He wants to be sitting at his table. He wants to fellowship with me. He wants to eat with me. He gets joy from knowing me. That always blows my mind, right? Because you think of the relationships we have, and there are people you can't stand, and you have a tough relationship with, and you see them come, and they bring anything to your life but joy. You're like, oh my goodness, here they come again. Oh, Lord, give me patience. Give me strength. Give me strength with this one. Oh my goodness. And you can't find any commonality. There's no joy. You don't want to grow in this relationship. You want to get away from this relationship. And yet the God of the universe looks at that person who you can't even stand to look at and says, that's my precious child. I love them. I love to spend time with them. I want to hear from them. I want to commune with them. I want to talk with them. He say, okay, Lord, you, you can because I don't want to. He takes great joy in that, that we belong to him. So the Holy Spirit introduces us into this family of God. We're going to, again, talk about this next week, but verse 9 is already hinting at it. That through the Holy Spirit, we belong to Christ. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit's work in salvation is a work of regeneration. And, and I'm always tempted to go back to the definitions of these words, but I've given you these definitions, hopefully, in the past, and you remember what these words mean. 
Verse 10, but Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit's in you. The Spirit of Christ, Christ is in you. God is in you. Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life is life because of righteousness. We are alive spiritually because the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, lives in us. He is life. He brings life to us. So if he lives in you, you're alive. You're spiritually alive. You are alive in Christ. Our flesh is dying, but we are alive in Christ because the Holy Spirit has given us this life because he is the spirit of life. We are alive because the Spirit is in us. Look at the second one. We are alive because of Jesus' righteousness. Look at the end of verse 10. It says that we are in the Spirit, right? The Spirit's life because of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Whose righteousness brought you life? Your righteousness? Your righteousness only brings you death because you have none. The only righteousness you have is self-righteousness, the kind of righteousness you don't want to have. Right? The only thing we contribute to salvation is what? Sin. The sin that, that makes Jesus go to the cross. That's the only contribution we contribute to our own salvation is the very sin that caused the Son of God to go to the cross in the first place. It's not our righteousness. We are, we are, the Holy Spirit regenerates us, lives in us, because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which we refer to as justification by faith. So here we stand before Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit. We are justified. We are regenerated. The word regeneration also means born again, John chapter 3, right? You, we, are, we are alive. Christ, uh, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit makes us alive. He's the Spirit of life. We're clothed in righteousness of Christ, but our mortal physical bodies are sinful, unredeemed, and dying, right? We get a reminder of that every day. Every single one of us over the age of, I don't know, 40, got a reminder this morning that you're dying. Young people, they didn't get that reminder. You got that reminder as you took, a, took an extra couple seconds to get out of bed and you heard your, your joints pop and your knees pop and your neck make weird noises, you know, as you sort of got to the, to the bathroom for the eighth time tonight, right? You, these are reminders that you're dying. These are reminders that you're dying. Sometimes when, when I'm feeling a little cheeky, I always say to Tammy, I say, well, one, one day closer to death. We're one day closer to our deaths today. So mark that one off. We're that much closer. We're 24 hours closer to dying. You know, that's the, it's the reality, right? We are on the path of death. Our flesh is dying. It's unredeemed. This is why chapter 7 is so important to Romans, because the Apostle Paul is saying, in our flesh, the presence of sin in this world, although sin is dead to us, it's still here. It's still here. He is regenerous. We are alive in Christ, but our flesh still struggles with sin. But the Holy Spirit is regenerous. We are alive in Christ. And here's the good news. We are alive spiritually, and we will be alive physically, right? Because there's the hope of resurrection. We've been regenerated. We're alive spiritually. Look at verse 11. Right on the heels of our regeneration, our spiritual new birth, comes our physical birth, new birth. Look what it says. If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, your physical bodies, through His Spirit who dwells in you. He's regenerated. You are alive spiritually. You are saved, justified, redeemed, Set apart, you are alive in Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins, declared righteous in Him spiritually, and guess what? God's got a plan for you physically too. God cares about your physical bodies. He cares about flesh and blood. It's just not a spiritual work, it's a physical work. Because guess what? The, the Holy Spirit who regenerated you spiritually will resurrect you like He resurrected Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's an awesome, hopeful thing. That gives us great hope. I mean, and think of how he said it. He just, didn't, he just didn't say, you know, the Holy Spirit will resurrect your physical bodies one day. You know what he says? He said, just like he raised Jesus from the dead, he's going to raise you from the dead. Think about that for a minute. The same Holy Spirit, the same power, the same process, the same resurrection that happened to the Son of God is going to happen to us. What happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. Our physical bodies will rise again will rise again, and then there'll be no more sin. There'll be no more corruption. This corruptible body will put on incorruptibility, 1 Corinthians 15. There'll be no more sin, no more shame. There'll be no more sickness, no more pain. These bodies will be perfected. The same resurrection that happened to Jesus will happen to us. I just, that's awesome. And you think about that for a minute from Jesus' point of view, that the Son of God condescended himself. Is that the right word? He descended down to our level and experienced everything we experience, even our resurrection. He didn't step out for a moment and say, it's going to be great. One day you're going to resurrect all these human beings, these sinners, and you're going to save them. That's great, but I'm not going to go through that process. I don't want to go through that process. He didn't have to go through that process. But in his identification with us, 
As sinners, he said, I'm going through the exact same thing you're going to go through. I'm going to die. I'm going to spill my blood. I'm going to suffer pain. I'm going to suffer emotional, physical pain, social pain, all the pain that, you, you, that you'll suffer. I'll suffer that. I'll die like you die. I'll be buried like you're buried. And I will be raised like you're raised by the exact same Holy Spirit, the same power, the same person that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us from the dead in the exact same way. I love that. That's great hope. That's the kind of hope that we have at funerals, especially Christian funerals. This isn't the end. There's a resurrection coming. And we know that. We're here to remind ourselves and mourn for those that we, we lose, but we're here to encourage one another that there's a life coming. Resurrection is coming right around the corner. You're going to blink your eyes and you're going to be resurrected. He says later in verse 23 of chapter 8, he says, the creation is groaning for this resurrection. But it says, we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. We are waiting for our bodies, our physical bodies to be redeemed. Spiritually, we've been redeemed. We've been justified. And we wait now physically to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. This gives us great assurance. gives us great hope. Look at your body. You know, it says in, in uh, what was it, Romans 4, when it's talking about Abraham, he looked at himself, wasting away. You know, don't do this too often because you get discouraged. Uh, but take a good long look in the mirror, you know, and just say, man, I have changed. You know, some of us, I used to have hair. I don't have hair anymore. Or my hair used to be beautiful and flowing and long and dark and black. Now it's all gray. And I used to have this and this. And, and, and you, you begin to care, prepare yourself how you used to be when you were young. And look away, this body is wasting away. For 2 Corinthians 4 said, but we don't lose heart because our outer self is wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day. If you could somehow see your spiritual self, wouldn't that be great? You look at your physical self. Man, I don't have a lot of days left, it looks like. I don't look so good. But spiritually, if I could see spiritually, you would see I'm growing closer and closer to Jesus Christ. I am, my soul is being prepared for my reunion with the God of the universe. We don't, we're wasting away on the outside, but inside we're being renewed day by day. God has good news for our bodies. We are regenerated spiritually. We are regenerated. We will be resurrected. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He gives us new life spiritually, and He gives us new life physically. You will live in a physical body for eternity. Your body, your, it'll be perfected, okay? It'll be perfected, no sickness, no, no, no health, no, no extra pounds, you know, Lord willing, you know, we'll, we'll be perfect in heaven, and we'll live forever in our physical form. We'll have other abilities, but this is the way God meant for us to live for eternity. So here we are in the flesh, and we are wasting away in the flesh. Sin is still hampering us. It's still ensnaring us in the flesh. Spiritually, we're alive. Physically, we're struggling with sin. So what now? We saw the work of the Holy Spirit. He's in us. What is He doing now, right now, in me to make me ready for heaven, to sanctify me, to grow me? That's the second half of our sermon. I want to talk about what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Okay? So let's, let's go to verse 12. We, we talked about the Holy Spirit regenerating us, baptizing us, resurrecting us. So then, okay, therefore, that's like a therefore word, based on what was just said in verses 9 through 11, based on these truths about the Holy Spirit, okay, based on this, we know this about the Holy Spirit. So then, apply it now, brothers and sisters. Apply this. What's the first application? You're a debtor, you're obligated. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you and you're walking according to the Spirit, you are obligated. You have a debt, and your debt is to walk in the Spirit. Your obligation is to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. You are not obligated to walk in the flesh. That's what it says first in verse 13. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. You owe nothing to your flesh, you owe nothing to sin. You are not obligated to live in sin any longer. That should free you up. That's a, that is a powerful statement. You no longer have to sin. The sin has no power over you. The only power sin has over you is the power you give it as a Christian. Jesus Christ cut that chain of, of sin in your life. You may not realize that, but that's the truth. Sin has no penalty. You're no longer going to hell. You're no longer condemned. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those of Christ Jesus, right? All this chapter flows out of verse 1, and it no longer has power over you. Sin can come, Satan can come up to you and say, Alan, you got to do this, you got to do this. And I can say, no, I don't. No, I don't. I have Jesus in my life. The Holy Spirit lives in me. I, have, I am under no obligation to do anything you tell me to do. Sin no longer can control you unless you let it control you, right? You got to know this. As, a, as an unsafe person, you have no choice. You can only do what sin tells you to do. 
But as a believer, you have a choice now. What are you going to do? How are you going to live your life? Which way are you going to walk? We are not obligated to the flesh. The flesh does not control us. It has no power over us. We do not live in the flesh. We do not live in the realm and the reign of sin. We live in the realm and the reign of Jesus Christ. We are under the Holy Spirit's authority. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Don't let it reign in your life. Look what it says at the end of verse, is it verse uh, 13, 12. You live according to the flesh, verse 12, 13, the beginning. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to what? You're going to die. You're going to die. Um, if you live according to the flesh, let's put it this way. If your life is categorized and defined by the flesh, you are not a Christian. You are on your path to die. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many times you go to church and read your Bible, all stuff. If you live a life that is categorized and defined by living according to the flesh, by definition, you are not a Christian. A Christian can choose to live by the flesh for a time. I, I recommend you don't. We can struggle with sin. We can go in and out of sin. But if your life is only and always defined by living according to sinful desires, your own selfishness, you are not a believer. You're not a believer. You should have no assurance of your salvation. That's what it means to, to live according to the flesh. So as a believer, stop living by the flesh. Stop operating by the flesh. And don't envy dead people. Your life, your job, your neighborhood, hopefully not your families, but maybe your families, are filled with dead people going to hell that have rejected salvation, rejected away Jesus Christ, Maybe they paid lip service to it. Maybe they said things, but they've rejected that. They're dead. They're on their way to hell. They're, they are walking by the flesh. It says right here that you will die. That, that's what this world is filled with, with dead people on their way to hell. And it should break your heart. And you should do everything you could possibly do to, to, to rescue them and get them to heaven. But what you should never do is envy them. Envy these dead people. Why would you envy a dead person? Why would you envy someone who's gone on the way to hell? Why would you look at their life and say, I wish I had what they had. I wish I could do what they did. I wish I was like them. Why would you ever envy someone who is on the broad path to hell? That's stupid. That's downright dumb. You, you should pity them. You should witness to them. You should love them enough to share the gospel with them. But the one thing you should do is not envy them. These are dead people. Why do you want to envy them? Why do you want to live like them? Why do you want to live like them? The Bible talks about people that have the, the very scent of hell, the very scent of, 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 of hell on them. They smell like hell. Why would you want to live like those people? Makes me, you know, it's not a time for a joke. Well, maybe it is a time for a joke, you know, living it up a little bit. But this guy, guy, rich guy had a brand new sports car. I don't know, what's a big sports car? A Lamborghini. Are they still around? Ferraris. I don't know. I'm a pastor. I don't know anything about these things. Um, you know, a new Corvette. I don't consider that a luxury sports car. I mean, that's low end, you know. But it's, okay. So <laughs> the rich guy's getting buried in his brand new Corvette. And they're looking at him and say, wow. Someone says, that's living. That's living. He's dead. He's in his car. He's not dead. He's dead. It's not, that's not living, but that's how we look at it. That's how we envy dead people. Look what he got. Look what he has. He doesn't have anything. Don't envy people that are on their way to hell. That's, that's stupid. We're not obligated to the flesh. What we are, second point, is obligated to live by the Spirit and to kill sin in our lives. Verse 13 is very clear. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit lives in you, or the Spirit by, you live by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of the body. You'll kill sin, and you will live. Every moment of every day, you are making choices and you're moving in one direction or the other. You are moving either towards sin or towards Jesus. There's only two ways you can go. You're either getting closer and closer to, to Christ or you're getting farther and farther away from Christ. Every day, you're making your justification a reality in this world or you're making your condemnation a reality in this world. That's the only two ways. That's the, you're moving in one of two ways. You are growing, and as a Christian, Christians grow towards Jesus over time. You step back. I've been a Christian for, what, well, however long. You step back and look at your life and say, I'm moving closer and closer to Jesus Christ. That's called sanctification, by the way. That's what sanctification is. We're not moving towards sin. We're moving towards Christ. We're not moving towards the flesh. We're moving towards Christ. 
That, that's just, this verse, 8.13, is, the, is, is, a, is an essential verse when it comes to our sanctification. Right here, 8.13. It's such an important verse. In fact, an entire book was written uh, on it called The Mortification. That's an old way of saying killing. You mortify, like we have morticians, you mortify death. And it was written by John Owen, and it was written in 1656. Here's a copy of this updated copy. The Mortification of Sin. How you kill sin in your life. How the Holy Spirit empowers you to kill sin in your life. Because that's what you got to be doing. John Owen's famous quote that we still quote today, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. One or the other. You're moving one way or another. Either you're killing sin or sin's killing you. You're moving towards sin in the flesh or you're moving towards, towards Jesus Christ. One or the other. And in, in 1656, he wrote this book, and the whole book is based on chapter 8, verse 13. It's written on this verse. The entire book, The Mortification of Sin, is written based on chapter 8, verse 13, and he's giving us ways and reasons to kill sin to kill sin. So I'm going to use his outline, if you don't mind. I'm going to use his outline uh, that he uses. Uh, so this is 1656. The first thing he starts with is with a question. Here's the question. Look, how, look at how verse 13 starts. For if. If is a question word. If. There's a question. If. What way are you going to walk? What are you going to live by? Who are you going to walk? Are you going to walk toward the flesh? Are you going to walk toward the spirit? Here's your choice. Here's your choice. You, before salvation, you could only walk on the broad path to destruction. You didn't have a choice. Now as a Christian, you have a choice. Which way are you walking, Christian, brother, sister? Where are you headed to? Which way are you going? Which path are you on? Are you in the path of flesh or are you in the path of the Spirit? Where are you walking to? What's your end goal here? You have a choice, but beware your choice. Because if your choice is only always the flesh, like I said, you're not a believer then. If that's the only way you ever walk, you were never saved. Which way are you headed as a believer? Because it's the question comes to you. The second thing, the second point is the person. For if you, look at it, it's directed towards you. You have to kill your sin. You have to kill your own sin. That's how it works. You must be killing sin in your life all the time. I can't kill sin in your life. I wish I could. I can't. Believe me, I got my hands full of my own sin. Okay, I got enough to handle right here. I'm killing enough on my own. I can't kill for you. The church can't kill sin for you. The, the others can't kill sin for you. This is something you have to do through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. Kill your sin. Identify it and kill it. You have to choose to kill your sin. You have to choose to stop walking the way of the flesh as a Christian. Choose to kill sin. This is something that's fallen out of favor in the church of Jesus Christ. We don't talk about sin. Sin is winked at. It's smiled at. We don't think anything about sin anymore. That's not scriptural. That's not right. We need to go back to John Owen and talk about killing sin. In fact, I see in my little world that I live in, I see more effort, especially as a man, the, the, the sins that men typically struggle with, lust and pornography and those things, I see more from the world's point of view trying to defeat these sins than from the church. The church says, don't worry about it. We're all in the same boat. God will forgive you. Yada, 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 grace, 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 grace. Don't worry about it. Right? The world is saying, you need to kill this in your life because you'll never be a successful man. You'll never be a real man until you put this out of your life. I see that coming from the world. Taking sin more seriously than the church takes seriously. That's messed up. But that's true. That's true. You gotta, you, you gotta go after your sin. This is up to you. What are your besetting sins? Where do you struggle? Where are you entrapped by? What gets you? What gets you? Identify it and then kill it. You gotta do that. That's what the Holy Spirit is enabling you to do, right? So this is what, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit about the duty. He goes on next to the duty to kill sin. We just talked about it. We have to put to death, look what the verse says. You need to put to death, if you're in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body. That's our duty. Killing sin is your main job as a Christian. That's your main job. Growing like Jesus, killing sin. They go together. That's one of your main jobs. That's one of your main jobs, killing sin. Let's go through this. I, and I want to ramp this up so you get this. This is a daily killing. Every single day of your life, you need to kill sin in your life. You get up in the morning, you start killing the sin in your life. You wake up and you murder your old man. You murder your old man. You, you ruthlessly kill that old man in your life, that old nature that's dead spiritually that keeps haunting you. You kill it. 
You murder it because it comes back and it keeps coming back. Later on in the day, your old man comes back, begins to whisper in your ear some kind of temptation. What do you do? You turn around and you kill it again. You keep killing sin in your life every day, all day. Kill your sin. Do not allow, allow a foothold in your life. Don't allow a beachhead in your life because if you allow sin, a beachhead in your life, oh my goodness, all manner of sinfulness and wickedness will come out of that. You kill it every single day. You kill sin. Secondly, it's a serious killing. Again, like I said, we don't take sin seriously anymore. We need to get serious about our sin. You know, it's hunting season. I'm reminded about this all the time. Well, most of you and your hunters, all of you are in your hunters probably, right? You love hunting, hunt, 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 right? And, and hunting is the, is the process of killing. That's what hunting is. You're killing something, Right? And what do you do if you're a hunter? Well, you, if you're, and you are all, a lot of you, you, what do you do? You spend all year getting the right gear, the right weapon, the right location, right? You got to get that all set up. You're, you're, you're figuring things out. How best can I kill a deer in my life? I'm going to spend all my time and energy. You got to go at the right time of day. You got to have the right gear on. Did you, did you put the deer urine on you because they'll smell you? Do you have the right tree stand? Where are you? What kind of tree stand do you have, by the way? Oh, let me tell you about my, let me, what kind of gun are you? What kind of scope is on your gun? What kind of ammunition is it? Right on and on. You are more serious about killing deer than you're killing your own sin. You think more about how to kill a deer this deer season than about killing sin in your life. That's wrong. Nothing wrong with hunting. But if you are prioritizing killing an animal over killing your besetting sin in your life, there's something wrong with you. You're more serious about killing an animal than killing sin in your life. And let me tell you something. It's a lot harder, a lot, lot harder to kill sin than it is to kill a deer. It's hard work. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it. It's painful work. Get serious about killing your sin. It's a ruthless killing. You've got to be ruthless with your sin. You can have no mercy with your sin. You can take no prisoners. You can't make peace. So many of us, when you've been a Christian for a long time and you struggle with sins for a long time, and they keep coming back, keep coming. You know what we, the temptation is to make peace with it, right? Just to make peace with it. I'm never going to get rid of this, so I might as well just live with it. Not going to get rid of this. Not going to kill this. There's no way I can kill this. You make peace. We learn to live with it. This is a big problem in the church. It's a big problem. This is a problem that leads to discouragement and defeatism in the church of Jesus Christ because we've made peace with our sin. Don't treat your sin as harmless. Don't treat it as cute or, or small, right, or insignificant. You know, and, and this is the best way. When your sin is small and insignificant, stomp on it and smash it to death when it's little and cute. When your sin is little and cute and you're just messing around with it and hasn't got a hook on you yet, that's the time to smoosh it into oblivion, to stomp on it until it's dead. Because you don't want that thing to grow. It'll take over everything if you allow it to grow. It's a violent killing. It's a violent. Killing sin is violent. You know, there's a couple ways. There's a lot of ways, but, but you know how Jesus says to kill sin? He gives us a really graphic illustration. Here's how you kill sin. He says this, Matthew 18. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it off. Throw it away. It is better for you to enter the, the eternal life crippled or lame than to, with two hands or two feet, be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you sin, tear it out. Throw it away. It's better for you to enter with one eye than two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Pastor, I can't stop looking at pornography. You know, pluck your eyes out. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> Pull them out. Pull them out. That'll do it. You can't see it anymore. You can't see nothing now. Now, Jesus is not being literal here, but he is trying to give us the seriousness, the importance of sin in our lives. Pluck it out. Cut it off. Cut it off. That's serious. Strangle it. Suffocate it. Starve it. Choke it out. Don't feed it. Be ruthless with your sin. It's a hard killing. Sin does not want to die. It does not go down easy. It's not an easy kill. You don't sneak up on sin. You don't sneak up on it. You never sneak up on it. It's not easy to kill. In fact, when you kill your sin, and if you've ever had to kill a besetting sin, an addiction or something in your life that you spent years going after, you know it's a gruesome killing. It's gruesome. It's ugly. It's an ugly killing. There's a lot of blood, a lot of broken bones, a lot of guts spilled out, a lot of tears, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, a lot of pain. There's a lot of that in that. A lot of sweating, a lot of hurt. That's how you kill sin. It's not a pleasant thing. It's a hard thing to do. It causes a, a, a lot of collateral damage. It's a gruesome thing. It will fight you. Your sin will fight you to the death. It does not want to give you up. So when you go after it, it's going to fight 
as hard as it possibly can to stay in your life. You cannot treat sin with softness and kid gloves. You can't be gentle with your sin. Again, the church culture of today winks at sin, smiles at sin. Oh, sin, we're all sinners. We're all, we're all in the same boat, right? We're all in the same boat. That boat's going to hell, by the way. But we're all in the same boat, going to hell. Isn't that great? Let's just comfort each other with the truth that we're all going to hell together. That's great. Going to hell in a, in a bucket, but at least I'm enjoying the ride, right? We're all going. That's how the church treats sin. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. We're all, we're all sinners. We all got our own sin. We're not going to get rid of it. This is what we're being, we're being taught in church, not to kill, not to kill our sin, but to live with our sin. We need to reclaim and reteach the doctrine of sin. When is the last time you cried over your sin? When's the last time that in a moment of prayer or study of God's word or doing something, God brought home to you, the Holy Spirit brought home the conviction of sin in your life to the point that you wept over it? Some of you have never wept over your sin because you've never thought about your sin. Well, I'm just like anybody else. Come on. I mean, everybody does this. Everybody does this. Everybody does that. What's the big deal? What is the big deal about sin? I sin, you sin, we all sin. We're all in the same boat. We're all okay. We all come in here sinners. You know, there's no change involved. They're, 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 don't, you know, don't tell me to change and put away my sin because we're all sinners. It's, let me tell you this too. And, 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 and I'm guilty of this sometimes because it's really easy to identify sin out in the world. You know, we got drag queens teaching kids. We've got our president interviewing a transgender pervert and saying, I'm going to make sure that we can have transformation of children at age 13. Oh, that's great. You know, let's do, so we, we, ah, you know that, that's clear. You know what we, we hardly ever do is we point it back in ourselves. The, the problem the church is having is not that sin out there. It's what? The sin in here. It's the sin you brought into this sanctuary right now today that is hampering the church. Not what the president's doing, not what our governor's doing, not what the secular authorities are doing, not what other crazy churches are doing down the road with, with their you know, rainbow gay flags out front. It's not them. It's us. It's us. We will not put apart and put aside our sin and kill our sin. That is what's hampering the church of Jesus Christ. Not what they're doing. The world's acting like the world. They've always acted like that. It's us that's changed. It's the church that's changed. Read your Bible for goodness sake. There's nothing new under the sun. Read Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. The world's been doing the world thing for a long time. It's the church that's changed. We will not deal with our sin, and we have lost so much because it is the sin, our sin, that will sink us, not the world's sin. It's our sin. Number six, it's a self-defense killing. Okay, you kill sin or sin will kill you. This is self-defense Kill or be killed, right? Satan is a, is a lion seeking to devour you, and he will devour you. Sin will kill you, will devour every single thing in your life except your salvation. It will take everything from you, everything that you love, your family, your, 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 your security, your luxury, your happiness, your satisfaction. I don't know, whatever you have, whatever you're living for, sin will take that from you. You'll have no joy. It will kill your family, kill your spouse. It will kill your community. It will kill your nation. We're seeing sin run wild killing our nation. Proverbs 14, 13 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We live in a time of reproach, of condemnation in our nation because we've allowed sin to, to reign, to rule. You've got to kill it or it will kill you. There's no neutral ground. There's, there, there's no middle ground. Killing sin or sin's killing you. It's a necessary killing. If you say you love Jesus, if you say you love Jesus, it means by definition that you hate sin. They go together. I love Jesus, I love my sin. No, no, can't, that, it can't work that way. That's two opposites. Two opposites can't go together. You can't love your sin and love Jesus. You have to, by necessity, hate your sin and love Jesus. You can't get both of those things. You can't grow in your faith without killing your sin. That's sanctification 101. It's an urgent killing. Right now, if by the mercy of God, through my stupid sermon right now, the Holy Spirit's working in your life in a way that he has it, and he is putting his finger on something in your life right now in this moment, do it. Do it now, right now. Kill your sin now. Don't put it off. Don't, don't, that's what Satan wants you to do. Oh, Pastor made a good point about killing sin today. I'll have to think about that tomorrow. You won't think about it tomorrow. Don't do that. Do it now. Do it right now. This is an urgent. Purge it from your life. Throw it away. Cut it off. Tear it away. Burn it. Destroy it. Give it away. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? He says, your idol is money. Give it away and follow me. And what did he say? I can't. He's too rich. He couldn't. He couldn't kill sin in his life. 
and, and, and Jesus loved him. He looked at him. He loved him, and he walked away from Jesus Christ. That could be you. That could be you right now. Jesus is saying something to you. Holy Spirit is saying something to you right now. Get rid of this. Cut this off. Pluck this out. Stop this. And you're saying, oh, uh, I can't. And you're walking away from me. You've got to realize the, the urgency. It's a premeditated killing. You've got to premeditate. You have to have a plan on how to kill your sin. You've got to have a plan on how to kill your sin. I used to tell my teenagers this when I was a youth pastor. If you want to be pure in your relationship with your girlfriend, and you're waiting until you're alone in the back seat with your girlfriend, that's too late to have a plan. It's too late. You lost the battle already. You've got to have a plan up front. You got, this is a premeditated killing. You've got to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. Okay. I know my sin. I know my temptation. I know when in the day I'm tempted. I know how I'm tempted. I know who I'm tempted around. I know, I'm, I know this because I know me, and here's my strategy. Here's my plan. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have premeditated murder on your mind. How am I going to murder my sin today? How am I going to get rid of it? How am I going to kill it today? i got some challenges today. I'm going to be around some people who are going to influence me to sin. I know that. I know the guys like to go out, uh, have a few drinks after work. I know that I can't control myself when I'm having a drink. I know this is going to happen. I know that she's going to be there. I know that she's attempted. I don't know what it is. You know it's coming. You've got to have a plan, a strategy. When this happens, I do this. When this happens, I do this. Well, I leave. I don't go there. I make sure. You've you got to have a plan. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? When greed, lust, anger, pride comes up in your heart, do you have a plan to stop it down? Because if you don't, you're going to fall to it. We win or lose in our minds, right? And lastly, it's a liberating killing. Kill sin, and you will have such joy and power and purpose in your life. Some of you have never been free from sin. When you begin to kill sin, it will lift you to a higher level. You'll never understand. You'll have the joy of the Lord in your life. You'll feel literally like a freed slave, like a freed prisoner. You'll be like, I cannot believe the shackles that used to bind me, my greed, my anger. My, my, my anxiety, my fear controlled me, and I'm free of it. I, ne- I didn't know that there was a life on the other side of this. I didn't know how life could be without this sin in my life. It's liberating. Put to death the sinful deeds of your body. I could say a lot more, but I'm already out of time. How do we do it? Let's just wrap this up. We do it by the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body. If you live by the Spirit, you put to death. We do it by the power and work of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you just a few practical ways. We don't have time to develop these. Uh, Number one, cultivate a desire to kill sin. This is what John Owen says in Mortifying Flesh. When you sin, consider the guilt of your sin. Consider the danger of your sin. Consider the evil of your sin. Think about it. And cultivate a desire to want to kill sin. Secondly, meditate on God's Word. The weapon we have is the sword of the Word of God. The sword. Meditate on God's Word. We need God's Word every day. Meditate on God's Word. Pray for deliverance. Pray for deliverance. Make this a matter of prayer. Seek the Lord. Pray and ask for strength. Fourthly, practice obedience. Practice obedience. I know I'm going quick. We don't have time. You can get them later. Practice obedience. You know what that means? Here, I mean, maybe this sounds so simple. Just stop doing it. Just stop. Or start doing something you should be doing. Stop doing what you shouldn't be doing. If you have the, the, the ability, just stop it. Just stop. Some people don't. Some people have addictions and other things. They, these habits have grown up and have power over them. If they don't, then simply stop doing it. Simple. You want to lose weight? Stop eating snacks. Just stop it. Just stop eating snacks. Oh, you just can't. Well, then we have another strategy. The main strategy is just stop. Don't, don't, don't buy them. Don't fellowship with them. Don't be around sin. Don't be around sinful people. Don't go to places where you know you're tempted to sin. If you have to get a new job, you get a new job. Get, get out of there. Where if you're tempted to sin, you can't. Then you, 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 do, you do it. Third, third, stop using your members for sin and, and stop being drawn away by your sin. James says that we are drawn away by our sins and enticed. Don't be drawn away. You know, let's go back to hunting. Well, I don't know if this is hunting. I don't know. You're in the woods, right? And and you're walking, and you hear a twig break behind you. Right? Be ready. That's sin. That's sin. You just heard it. It's, It's creeping up on me. It's crouching at my door. There it is. The lion. Be ready. Be alert. Don't be drawn away by it. Oh, what is that? What's that? Like in the movies. What's that sound? Let me go investigate that sound. <laughs> That's what we do as Christians. What was that? Was that sin? I don't know. Let me go check in this dark room over here. Oh, it was sin. You're in. 
Be aware. Be ready. Don't be drawn away. It wants to draw you away. It wants to lure you away. Don't take the bait. Don't be stupid. Don't take the bait. And some of you have been taking the bait for decades. You know the bait. You know what it is. You entertain something in your mind you should never entertain. You think about something you should never think about. It's a familiar road. In fact, science will even tell you there's, there's some kind of drug that's released, some kind of endorphin release when you sin because it feels good. So you're reinforcing these pathways in your mind and in your thinking to continue in sin. Don't do that. Don't be drawn away. Be alert. And here, number five, I'm going to start hitting this one really hard in the coming weeks. Get to church. Make church a priority. There is power. There is power. Sitting in these pews, under the Word of God, singing truth, praying, fellowshipping, all that. There's power in that to fight sin. You can't do it by yourself. And what happens? What happens? What does the Holy Spirit ultimately work in us? Look at the end of verse 13. Put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. You'll live. Don't you want to live? Don't you want to live, don't you want to live here and now, the abundant life Christ promises? Don't you want to live in eternity in a, in, a, in a place that He's preparing for you? Don't you want to live? You will live. This is our sanctification. This is our process of growth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I pray that this... Uh, verse it came home to us, Lord. I pray the truth came through in some way, in some fashion, that somehow the power of your Holy Spirit can latch onto something and drive it down deep into our hearts and minds, Lord. We are sinners, and we have become comfortable with our sin. We have made peace with our sin. We have given sin not just a beachhead in our hearts, but a, but a home, a mansion, a whole military base right in our hearts to wreak havoc in our lives. And we've done this over time, and, and we've been given nice little head pats by other Christians and given excuses and justifications for why we sin, Lord. Let's just throw them all out the window. Help us to get rid of all of those and go back to square one and see our sin for what it is an affront to you. An affront to your grace and your love for us. It is, it, is, it is the kiss of Judas every time we sin. It is a betrayal of what you've done in our lives. Lord, we are under the obligation to walk by the Spirit now, not by the flesh. Drive that point home to us. We need it. We need it. I need it. We need this, Lord. That we might be a holy people, a righteous people, a good people that seek you first, that live, live by you and by your law and by your rules that when the world looks at us they see a, 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 a qualitative difference in us a different type of life a different type of living and they see it and they notice it Lord that's how we know that, that we are progressing in our sanctification Lord and I pray that would be true for me and my brothers and sisters here today press that upon us Lord we pray this in your name amen Let's go ahead and stand up as we uh, dismiss. Remember, uh, opportunities to sign up for Thanksgiving dinner. That's out there uh, on, the, on your way out. Something we've been doing for years, a great outreach to provide that, but we need you all to help with that. So you can see that on the way out. And uh, let me pray for you as uh, we go. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would bless us and keep us. I pray that you would Shine your face upon us and give us grace and give us peace. Lift your countenance towards us and bring us Holy Spirit power, real power. Not, not a feeling of power, not an experience of power, but the power to kill sin in our lives, Lord. That by this time next week, we might come here rejoicing in the work that the Spirit did in our lives this week to help us defeat sin to go a week without sin, to go a week in righteousness. Lord, I pray that that would be the testimony of many of us next week, Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen.